workshop on graphic design, translating branding to design. Um, so we've got a really cool activity that I think we'll be running through, which will be really exciting. So thanks for coming. And we'll awesome. Yeah, the activity is not to the end, so if you want to do the fun bit, you've got to stick through all the, all the <laughs> um, I want to thank Bloom and Mark for having me. I'm very excited. Um, so as Diane said, I'm Mara, um, and if you're wondering that I talk a little bit funny, it's because I have a Dutch accent, and if I make stuff up, or if something sounds very weird, it's probably just because I'm, I'm not, because English is not my first language, so I'm just, just go with it. <laughs> uh, so the theme of this workshop series is the um, skill that you want to teach you, and that's actually really interesting, because when I did my design degree, I went to an arts academy instead of going to a university that specializes in design. <coughs> And I did that because I really wanted to be in an arts-driven environment and learn different skills that I otherwise would not have learned in uni. Um, and it's it's quite interesting because the design department in that academy was a real underdog because it was all fine arts students and teachers as well. So within the so maybe there was. 20% of the whole school, which was very small, maybe 200 students in the whole academy. So maybe 20% of that was um, design, 
so that environment was really nice and warm and lovely, but then you had to deal with all the fine art students who were constantly trying to question why on earth you would be doing design, so I was a real underdog. Um, but that was, that was really interesting because it really made me believe that if everybody's constantly questioning you what you're doing and you still have this passion to do it, then you're obviously doing the right thing. Um, <coughs> And I'm still very happy that I made that decision to go to that um, academy and learn things a little bit different because I've learned skills that I use today um, and I was really happy that I left with a degree without a stamp on my forehead that said graphic designer. Um, because, and then I moved to Perth like two weeks after I graduated and I thought, oh well, that stamp would have in handy by now. <laughs> so um, but then I met Claire and Adam from Tinderbox and um, and they showed me the process that they're doing which is really quite different uh, than the traditional way of branding. So that was, yeah, I'm really happy that that I found them because otherwise I wouldn't know where I would have gone with all my um, with all my like skills that are a bit different from the norm. Um, so since this talk is an introduction about design as well, um, I wanted to show you the difference or talk about the difference between art and design before I start talking about the tinderbox process, just so that we're all on the same thing um, when we talk about stuff. So does anyone here have an idea or an opinion on the difference between art and design? Yes? One sticks to a brief, the other doesn't. Yeah, that's, that's a good anyone else have any any ideas yeah um, one tends to look at form the other one tends to look at function that's a very interesting one as well yeah so um so <laughs> these these differences are a bit generalized of course a bit black and white um there's always exceptions to every rule but <coughs> the most obvious reason uh or the most obvious difference that an artist is expressing himself like you said earlier um, and they often have an idea of feeling that comes from themselves and they want to get that across and into the world. Um, whereas a designer usually starts with a message that has to, that like the, the, the message is fit like a brief and, and that has to be shared. And if you look at, if an artist makes a piece of art and you get 10 people as an audience looking at that piece of art, you will get probably 10 different answers when you ask them, how does it make you feel? What do you think it's about? Um, what does it mean? Whereas hopefully when something is designed well, you have a message that has to come across. And if it's designed well, then hopefully those 10 people will have a similar answer to what, what they think that design piece has to come across. So, in a nutshell, ours lends itself to the interpretation by the viewer, um, whereas design often has a message that needs to come across. Um, so again, these differences are a bit, a bit general, and I mean, I certainly think that art and design can intertwine really well. I'm all, I'm all for it. That's why I did my degree um, at Arts Academy. Um, but it's good to know the basic differences. So now. I know when you ask this question about art, it's always, you know, what is art? Nobody nobody really knows. Um, so what about design? What do you think, what, what could be a good description of design? Anyone? So there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of um, definitions. So one could be the art or profession of visual communication that combines images, words, ideas to convey information to an audience. Another one that I quite like is problem solving rather than pre-making. I think um, there's a bit of a trend at the moment where people just, I think, it's, I think it's from a quote that goes something like, I just want to get enough sleep and make pretty things. To me, that's not what design is about. Design has to be, or it doesn't even have to be, but often it needs to be aesthetically pleasing but it's not just about being pretty, there's often a problem that needs to be solved and design is there to do that. Um, so 
one I also really like <coughs> is making life better, providing joy. That's often what um, what design does, not necessarily always graphic design, but lots of other um, variations of design are there to improve things and to enjoy and make life a little bit easier. Um, I've also got a little video that I'll show you. Um, it's a little bit long, so I'll just show you the beginning. It just gives a nice idea of what we're talking about. First and foremost, graphic design has to communicate something, but good graphic design makes people's lives better. You have to find a way to make sense of how to make something beautiful, and to me, you're speaking for them. As a graphic designer, concept is the first thing. Idea and life. Graphic design is essentially a language for living. design is about using words and images to convey a message. Graphic designers have to know a lot about color theory, typography, how to create a grid, but those are all really basic. You have to be somebody that is really interested in understanding human behavior, being able to understand how they think, how they choose, how they buy, how they believe. People probably don't think about how much graphic design impacts them. We use graphic design to cross the street, to decide what we want to eat and how much we want to eat. We use graphic design to pay our bills, to get married. We use graphic design to get divorced. <laughs> we use graphic design in every single aspect of human life right now. And people tend to like things best when they feel that they are respected by that thing. But I think ultimately, if it moves you, whether it be a good emotion or a bad emotion, chances are then it's effective because it's getting you to think about something and it's getting you to potentially take action. So I thought that was a really nice little um, example of what graphic design and um, Especially that last bit where she talks about the, <laughs> where um, where it's that human, like you really have to want to understand human um, behavior and how people feel and what you know what um, what people get from when they see something. Um, so Tinderbox's process is one of. Um, brand storytelling. There's good stories, there's bad stories, there's interesting stories, there's boring stories, um, but stories all connect emotionally with people um, and importantly if you have a business they connect with your audience um, and an organization needs to tell good stories and they need to invest in the right people to, to get these stories across. Um, but before I talk more about our process we need to talk about empathy and um, empathy it's like this non-negotiable <coughs> part of our process. Um, businesses are often designed to not have any empathy and to not be vulnerable at all. But it, what we're trying to do with <coughs> the box is trying to create brands that are human and in order to be that, they need to have empathy. So I'll have another little video, which, um, which is by Brené Brown. Um, and so this, this talks about the difference between empathy and sympathy, just so that when I say empathy, we're all on the, on the same page, because, um, <coughs> yes, they're very different things, and it's, it's a very nice little animation that talks about this. So what is empathy, and why is it? very different than sympathy. Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole 
and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, whoo, it's bad, uh huh? Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Traditionally, when you would hire a designer or a branding agency, one of the first things they ask you is, what do you do, and who is your <coughs> audience? And that's also what they would do. How many of you are... We didn't want to watch that. <laughs> so, traditionally, um, you know, they ask you, what do you do, and who is your target audience? And so is there any design students in the room? Have they have they taught you that yet? No? Well, wait, wait for it. It will come. Um, so at Tinderbox, we like to do the opposite. Um, instead of asking what you do, we try to figure out who you are and what your personality really is. Um, so by doing that, we can adapt your brand to suit um, it's kind of like, how to explain it? Um, so rather than trying to find the right audience, we try and create you, we try and create a personality behind your brand that will attract the right people. So imagine, imagine if I want to be friends with you, so I'm going to change myself so that you'll like me and you'll want to be friends. That, that doesn't really sound like a good friendship, does it? So, <laughs> But that's, that's how so traditional marketing and branding, that's what, they, that's what they do. They say, oh, you want to attract you know, women between 30 and 35, then you have to be like this and do like that and say this and look like that. And then you'll attract those people. Whereas um, what we try and do is like, if I'm myself and I know who I am as a person and I can put that out in the world and the right people will want to be friends with me and the people that, that, that don't really like that or don't really connect with with those aspects, they are not really the right audience anyway. It's a much more human and authentic way of attracting people and create a lot more um, like a better brand affiliation. So that's where storytelling comes in. Um, so the way we find out who you are as a brand is by using brand storytelling or story branding, um, which is not to be mistaken with us telling the story of your organization. Um, storytelling is a bit of a buzzword at the moment. It's like um, it's like content marketing last year. It's it's storytelling this year. So at Tinderbox, we want to be very clear that we're not storytellers. We don't tell your story, but we apply authentic <coughs> storytelling techniques to the branding process. Um, so once the brand voice is established, um, once the brand has a personality, 
makes it much easier for a designer to create the visual side of the brand because you have a much better understanding of who they are and and then you can kind of create a picture in your head of what that would look like. Um, and by using this process, your audience, leave, your audience will kind of intuitively understand who you are. Like they, they won't really need to explain it to themselves, they'll just feel it. Um, which is very different than the traditional way of branding, which, which is very rational and analytical. Um, brands are giving dry, um, analytical data and then that was made into into um, a brand and also so we don't think of your brand as a logo um, it's not your identity and it's not your product it's a gut feeling about you the organization or the brand um, that lives deep inside each and every one of your customers um, and it comes from how your brand looks and walks and talks and you know, what you wear and how you answer the phone and the kind of tone that you have in um, in an email, the kind of colours your brand, or your, your logo or your visual identity would have. Um, so we, um, at the Box, we view your brand as a spirit. Um, it's kind of everything that your organisation is about. Um, but because we're trying to bring that human element in it, like humans, it can be very complex. Um, so that's where um, emotional decision making comes in and that um, subconsciousness. So 95 of our thinking takes place in the um, subconscious mind. Um, so the conscious mind can um, process about 40 bits of data per second, whereas the subconscious mind um, 10 million bits per second. So that's where design really comes in because the visual um, part of your brand is the first thing people will see and they might even only you know it's it's out in the world it's, it's not often that you will see a brand just on a nice white sheet of paper by itself so while your subconscious mind is processing <coughs> 10 million bits of data per second your visual language is the first thing that that they will get um, and because it's all subconscious, you need to, like we like to start the process a bit more intuitively. Um, so there's been this research um, that tells us that all decisions are made emotionally and then your rational part of your brain backs it up. So for example, you, know, you, you find this pair of jeans that you really, really like and you've already kind of emotionally decided that you want to buy them and then your rational mind will think oh well you know my other jeans broke last week and now I really have one pair of jeans so you know I kind of really need this and then you think you 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 decided to buy those jeans because you made a rational decision but actually you, you've made it you've made it with your emotional part of your brain um, before you backed it up rationally and that's why it's much um, more effective if you can create a brand that connects with that emotional part of the brain rather than the rational part of the brain. Um, so the way we do this is by using archetypes and that's where these cards come in that you've all found on your chair or were handed out. Um, so Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell um, described archetypes as familiar characters that transcend time, place, gender, culture, age, um, and they represent an eternal truth. So it's not something that we've just made up. It's a, it's a, um, it's an authentic technique that's used in storytelling. So archetypes, um, you can find them, you know, from children's books to movies to video games, um, comics. There's all you know the hero and the villain and the innocent in um, Superman or something. They're all archetypes, and I'm not sure if we're all born with an understanding <coughs> of who these archetypes are. But I think certainly at a young age, you will you will know you know if someone if a character in a story is is um, portrayed as a hero or a villain, you will have a very clear understanding of 
what their values are and what their character traits are. Um, and that's why the um, archetypes are so useful in branding, um, because we know who they are, so we don't really have to explain, like, hi, this is my brand, this is what I do, like, here's all my values and everything about me. If you, if you connect an archetype to it and you take, you know, everything that you do with your brand, you bring that back to the archetype, people just have this kind of understanding of who you are. Um, does that make sense? So internationally, especially in America, archetypes and this kind of process is being used a lot for branding. In Australia, it's not so much, but it's, it's starting a little bit now. And it's probably because clients are still um, demanding the analytical transactional approach because that's, that's just how it's been done. And sometimes it's difficult to, to stop doing something or change something that's, that's been done for a long time. Um, so, Imagine getting a brief to create a visual identity for an airline described as dynamic, value for money, innovative, successful, diverse, fun. Of course, when you get a brief, you get a lot more information. But does that spark any ideas? Do you have any idea what that looks like? What kind of colors that would be? Or what kind of typography you might use? Or if you know, if you need photography or more illustrative? Does that, like, does that mean much? So now imagine that the same airline is described as the Maverick. Does anyone here have the Maverick card? Is that, is that out in the open? No, maybe not? All right, I'll just read it out then. So the Maverick goes like this. Those may be your rules, but they aren't mine. I will not blindly obey. I will not keep my silence. I am not your sheep, your soldier, or your slave. Do not wrong me, do not underestimate me, and do not insult me. I never apologize for what is right. I celebrate non-conformity. I dare you to be different. So can you start to, you know, that's, does anyone have an idea what airline it might be? That, so they've actually applied this process. No, it's not, it's not Jasper. Um, if I say virgin, does that kind of yeah. meet? So if you get something in a brief like this, would that spark more of an idea of what that could look and feel like? Because you kind of have an idea of who they are. You can almost picture them. Um, so um, so uh, um, Virgin, if you would have the list of values, you know, it's, it's an airline that, given the chance, it will stand in opposition to um, established airlines. It's a bit cheeky, a bit bold. It will push the envelope. And when you read something like this in, an, in a brief as a designer, I think you get much more of a, like, I don't know, I think in pictures, and I think a lot of designers do that, but you kind of already start to see um, what it could look like, and that's really the power of using archetypes. So using archetypes in branding, um, it makes you reveal your brand's motivation, how it walks and talks, what the trigger points are, and how it really attracts the people that you want to, that, and that are part of kind of your um, tribe. And it forges meaningful relationship with um, you know, if, if, like people that are important to your brand. Um, and the last one, which is for design, very important, it's, it's that it's that gap that it bridges between the cognitive and the intuitive side of the brain because often design is very in intuitive. Um, you kind of have to go with your gut. So I have a few examples um, of brands that actually have had this technique applied to them. So the first one is <coughs> Apple, the um, artist or the creator sometimes called as well. Um, and I'll show you an ad. Is from 1997. Here's for the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round heads in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fun, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. 
Now, the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. It is the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. That's an ad from 1997, which has no products or services. So if you don't know what Apple does, you wouldn't really know now. Um, but you know who they are. And if they would have had, you know, a picture of a Mac from 1997, that video would be really dated. Whereas now, it's still very, still very much who Apple is now, and it's nearly 20 years old. So. So this is archetype villain, and we're really hoping to get a, an organization soon that has a villain archetype. I, I can't wait to design a brand with a villain archetype. Um, you know, you can imagine what that would be like. And of course, a villain is very, um, it's a very common character in stories or um, you know, comic books movies but it's not it, it wouldn't really be in branding because you wouldn't really want to portray yourself as the villain because you're not probably not going to get many customers um, so um, but actually Grand Theft Auto is one that is the villain um, I don't do many you kind of know what the game does right? it's pretty evil um, and it's and it's those people like they wouldn't do the things that they do in the in the video game they wouldn't do that in real life so that's probably why they or they can be the villain, you know, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't use the archetype for something that, you know, people do in reality. Um, so pedigree, if you ever might have another little, um, little ad, which is completely different, but it really shows you how these archetypes work. We're for dogs. Some people are for the whales. Some are for the trees. We're for dogs. The big ones and the little ones. The guardians and the comedians. The pure breeds and the mutts. We're for walks, runs, and romps. Digging, scratching, sniffing, and fetching. We're for dog parks, dog doors, There were an international holiday for dogs to celebrate their contribution to the quality of life on Earth. We'd be for that too. Because we're for dogs. So again, it's barely, <coughs> barely any, I mean, it's just a picture of the bag at the end. Um, doesn't really show, you know, if you wouldn't really know that they that there's that it's dog food, you still wouldn't know. And that's again that they they don't show what they do. They show who they are, and then you know, of course they're going to attract dog people, like people that don't like dogs. They they don't they don't need pedigree um, food, so um, they don't need to they don't need to bother with those people. Um, and so pedigree uses kind of every man, but with an entertainer voice. And recently, so this this ad's quite old. But recently, they um, they launched a new campaign, which still has very much that every man archetype in it. So they're very true to the um, brand archetype. Um, so Harley Davidson, the Rebel. You have to look a little bit longer at the picture, <laughs> and then you'll see it. Um, so with with Davidson, um, they reckon that they sell more. Um, belt buckles and key rings and boots and jackets and they actually sell motorbikes so it's that affiliation that people have with the brand without actually wanting the main product and services which are motorbikes um, so it's again a good example of that if you know who you are people will come to you no matter even you know if they, they don't even really need what you do but if they really like 
PlayStation, the Thrill Seeker, again, a really different one. I'll show you the ad for this one. It's a little bit um, controversial. Some people don't really like it, some people do, but. So, um, obviously that particular ad <coughs> is not um, designed for kids, it's very much targeted at their audience of the you know, male between um, maybe 25 and 45 or something. Because um, you wouldn't really. Sometimes we get clients and then we show them this video, um, and then if they're, if they're you know, some mums or um, they're, they're really like, oh. now, now, like their sons just asked for a PlayStation, like, no, 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 they're not getting that. Because they really have that disconnect with it, which is kind of, um, you know, that's, that's who PlayStation is. So if you don't connect with it, then um, it's not for you. Um, so, um, sensualist, um, often um, an archetype used in, well, obviously lingerie, but it doesn't always need to be sexual. It can be food or luxury items, cars, watches, perfume. It's, it's all about the sense, so the touching, smelling, feeling. Um, uh, so yeah, that's what it's used for. So you've all got these cards, and I thought, if you just want to have a read, does anyone not have um, if you want to have a read and maybe spend a little bit of time thinking if that's that's the personality, that's the archetype, what would that look like? What would that feel like? Um, anything that would spark, so what kind of colours or you know, what kind of what, what do you see when you when you think about that? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 y
Try to sort of push this whole sort of men in suits sort of thing. It's yep. like, um, uh, I don't know, sort of there's like, you'll always be powerful if you're in a suit and you wear nice oh, yeah. leather shoes and yep. stuff. And they never offer vegan shoes, so yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah that's a good one. And lots of watch brands too. Yes, yeah, that kind of old, um, yeah. old fashioned values. Yeah, that's a really good one. Anyone else? Urban <laughs> Yantra. Yeah, we get lots of um, non-for-profits who who wanna who have the nurture as their um, as one of their archetypes. Yeah, what about how about anyone else with a cut can go with beautiful? Can I just um, say with the maverick? I know everyone you you said it, but I thought it would be kind of quite a juvenile yeah. uh, in a lot of ways. Yes. Yes. So how do brands associate themselves with that without being seen juvenile as juvenile by um, corporations? So, well, it's it's how you. Um, so usually, what we do is there's two archetypes. One, um, which is kind of the default archetype. So, for example, if you're the um, if you're the bank, you need to be the defender or the like. You need to have that um, safe feeling about you. Otherwise, like often brands. Um, you kind of need to have a default one because otherwise people don't really take you serious. And then, you know, well, a bank is maybe a bad example for Maverick, but, you know, imagine that combination of the Defender and the Maverick, where you kind of, if you combine the two, then you can have the juvenile, youthful cheekiness of a Maverick, but you can kind of draw out the more secure, professional, um, grown up. With the um, with the defendant, it's usually what we try and do is combine two two archetypes for a brand so that you get a bit of tension. It's you don't really want to go too safe with both of them because then you kind of um, yeah, it kind of gets a bit a bit boring. Oh yeah, it's a good question. Um, and anyone else who had um, who had another archetype that they felt something. Anyone in the back that wants to share anything? Uh, everyday man. Oh yes. Yeah. So I was thinking uh, because it says here I don't want to, I don't need to work and uh, rather walk from side to side. Yep. So I was thinking like I'm going to 
Tinder is kind of doing that. Mm -hmm. The food drive is being so friendly with, with the people coming into the taxi. Yeah, so that's, so that's more... Um, so that's more what they do, and then attaching the, the archetype to that. So that might be that default um, archetype, the everyman. So what do you think then could be their, um, the other the other archetype that kind of... Because Uber is not just the everyman, I think. They have, they're a bit more... Yeah, probably. There's a lot of um, social enterprise that we get. They always want to be collaborative because they want to do something different, they want to change the world, and they have their own idea, and that's what they want to do. So, um, so yeah, that's, and yeah, that's, that's very suiting, I think. Yeah? I have a feeling. Um, oh, cool. And I think something about it is that it reminds me so much of, like, um, Wall Street. Like, don't step on the little guy. Oh, and yeah. Crush him until there's nothing left. It reminds yeah. me of, like, investment. Yeah. Maybe it's that yeah. bad conversation, but it reminds, it reminds me of, like, investment. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good one. Oh, maybe we should get get an investment company and we could just <laughs> make them into the villain. Yeah, I'm sure they would go for it. It would be cool though. Yeah. And is that like because you can read it on the cards, you know, what what it goes with the villain or you know with the defender or the maverick. But you kind of like before you read it, I think with most of the cards, would you kind of have an idea that you know who they are before you even even read it? So that, that's very strong that when you if you can if you can get that personality out there, you know, you don't like people just know who you are and that's really the powerfulness of of archetypes. Is there any other ones that want to share? Because this is quite cool. Uh, yeah. I got the connector. Yeah. So for the connector I was thinking well the first thing that came to mind was the Emirates ad. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, where they have like two people in the same place, one of them goes off into someone's person, and it's on to that person. Yeah. Uh, so that was one. And then the other thing I thought of was also if you have uh, professional groups and things like that, are you getting people together? Yep. So LinkedIn or Meetup or things like that. Yep. I think Bloom might be, um, they could have a bit of connector in them, I think. Um, yeah, it's a very, um, it's a very good, um, there's also lots of social enterprises, like I think, yeah, Connector Maverick is kind of the, the, the ones that people, um, social enterprises tend to go with. Can they go with something different? How, like, how could they differentiate themselves from those two, but still have those? Well, their... it's not. It's never really. So we don't really. Um, so what we do is we don't really um, meet with them, and then so we go through this whole process, and then at the end we say, "You are these archetypes." They always choose themselves because they're the ones doing it, so they have to know. Look, sometimes we can guide them like, oh, but you know, think about it this way, what you're trying to do is really this, and then, yeah, there's, there's often with that, um, the market expectation one is usually pretty set, but then there's that other one that you can really do in the voice, and sometimes, you know, you can have a maverick and a maverick that are a little bit different still, because it's the, it's still, it's that slight um, code switching, so, you know the way I am here today, or when I, why I'm, when I'm at home with my family, or um, you know when I'm at work, or when I'm when I'm at a bank or something. Like it's all an authentic version of myself, but slightly different. So that's often what you can have. Um, it's like the pedigree ad. So in that ad, they're still very everyman, but they use kind of a um, entertainer voice. Whereas with this recent ad, um, or it's not really. It's more a campaign. Um, it's actually quite it's a beautiful advert um, where they they have a dog, um, a prison, like a, so in prison because um, in America there's so many prisoners and then they match they meet they match them up with a dog and when they leave prison they have that dog and they have that companion so it's, that's very much every man but that campaign's not done in an entertainer voice obviously because that would be a bit be a bit weird um, <laughs> so. Um, so that's kind of how you can how you can differenti differentiate yourself as well. Are there any more questions or anything anyone wants to know or share about their archetypes or about team talks? Mm -hmm. Well, so good then. I hope. Oh, yeah. There's one. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to ask. Um, I'm, I'm so I'm just 
this through. So your clients, they come to you and then you give them all of these archetypes and then they decide and then from there you go on to create a kind of brand. Yes, so you so the first step is so we go through this process where we kind of find out, I mean we do find out what they do and what their purpose is and what their values are. Um, we have this exercise um, <laughs> which is a bit controversial for them in the beginning, but it's this metaphor. So Claire, who started Tinder Box, um, when she worked in agencies, she always had to ask clients, um, if your brand was a car, what car would it be? But then if you don't really know cars, then where are you going to go with that? And you know, everybody always wants to be the Maserati or the Lamborghini, but your brand might not be a Maserati or a Lamborghini. So you have all these conflictions. So um, one day she was she she um, she was talking about someone about burgers, and they thought, oh, we should just do it with burgers. And then as a joke, first they did it. So they asked, oh, if your brand was a burger, what would it be? And it works. It works every time. So that's part of the process. So we write up this story. Um, so people kind of write it down, and then it turns into the story because, like, using the metaphor is very um, useful because you draw out these values that you otherwise wouldn't get, kind of like the values with the um, Virgin example, where you know innovation, um, creativity, they're, they're always values that come out, but they don't really mean much anymore. So then when you talk about you know what a burger tastes like or feels like, or you know if it's, if it's crunchy bread or soft bread, or you know if you eat it outside in a, or in a really fancy restaurant, or then you kind of get these other values that are much more um, resonate a lot more um, so that's one of the things and then at the end we go through all the archetypes so there's about so Carl Jung came up with 20 archetypes but that's grown into about 60 but we don't obviously we don't show the clients 60 archetypes because it's a bit, a bit much so we so we work with these 20 um, and then you know there's this process of elimination so they go through um, you know not Definitely not that one, or that one, or that one, or that one. And then they make a yes and a no pile. Sometimes a maybe pile, but the maybe pile is always a no pile because it's a maybe pile. So, um, and then um, what happens is that Claire and Adam they kind of write a report and a, and a story. They kind of create the voice um, of the brand, and then I get that document to create the visual <coughs> side of a brand. And because I, so I read that brief and I get kind of already picture who they are by something by what their burger is and then the combination of the archetypes and then that so the archetypes in combination with the values really just sparks an idea and it's and it's kind of nice because you um, often design they want to narrow things down if it's this just you know where are you going to start so if you can narrow the, the things down if you can constantly go back you know you design something and you can go back to, oh, but does that really go with the philosopher or nurturer? And then, oh, maybe not, then you can just cross that through because you know that that's not going to work with that particular brand. I don't know, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, thanks. Cool. Yes. Can you talk through things like your recent work and how you thought that you Um, yeah, sure. So um, we've worked with, I'm not sure if anyone came across um, Growing Change to their organization um, that want to help um, you know, people that have become homeless or that, um, that are in a bit of, you know, have a bit of a troubled life and they want to help them through um, community gardens and that process. It's very, um, so they were the nurturer um, which is kind of their uh, default one. Um, and so I came up with, um, I'm going to show you now, but so instead of um, going to the computer, I painted their, um, their logo. It's very um, um, like transparent, like watercolor and
John see him? No. Oh, oh well, <laughs> too bad. Um, so I mean, that's also a, a thing that um, that I like to do, rather than going into the computer straight away and creating all these vectors, um, is hand drawing things and sketching and um, painting. Or once once we made a um, a logo for someone. Um, out of nails, like I had a big wooden board, stuck nails in it, and with string, and like made it, made it like that. Can um, I use my laptop to show you if you like? Oh yeah, yes. yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of um, yeah, it's very intuitive process. So it's not very much like oh you are the maverick, so I will do X, Y, and Z, and then you'll have a Maverick brand. It's, it's very much a... Uh, People really have to feel safe um, and kind of like a warm environment. So that's, for example, why all the letters are lowercase because I always find that that's a little bit. I mean, that's that's a bit technical, but um, I find that lowercase letters stay a bit more approachable, a bit friendlier, a bit warmer, a bit softer, um, rather than if you put them all in uppercase, which is a bit bolder, maybe a bit more maverick. Um, you know, if you have them traditional, so with the you know, it's the first letter, it's a capital, then that's more traditionalist, perhaps, maybe, um, for your gentleman brand. Um, so for this one, we chose to do it all um, lowercase, and so it's painted, so it has a bit that organic feel that they um, want to have, yes? Is that a nurturer? Yeah. Did you have another question? Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? Be a bit narrow, so you could probably abstract it a little bit. So it's really um, 
there's not really a, a black and white way of doing it. It really just depends on kind of who the client is in a way. Does that make sense? Any more questions? more. Um, in terms of archetypes, I kind of understand how you have a default one and then how you have the second one. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, or like what would happen if you, like if a brand wanted to switch or like transition into two totally different archetypes? Oh yes, that's a really good question actually because so um, what we've been doing lately is um, combining them. So sometimes there's, you know, little bits of, um, we're working on one at the moment where we combined the philosopher and the intellectual uh, and the explorer. So the, um, I can't really tell you who it is, but the intellectual one is the default one. And then the, um, she kind of felt philosopher and explorer, but they weren't, like it wasn't everything from the explorer and everything from the philosopher that, that she kind of um, felt right with. So we combined them into the seeker. Um, so that's often what we what we've been doing lately is kind of customizing the archetypes, which then um, because we have that broad range of sixty archetypes that we sometimes go to as well, um, we then combine them. And um, it doesn't really happen that it that they, well. So if they want to switch, so what happens is when we present them with the um, with the brand voice <coughs> document, the it's a, it's a collaboration um, piece, so you know if you read through it, and then often, often Glenn Adam when they write up the voice, they can already sense like oh maybe that archetype isn't right, maybe it needs to be slightly different, or maybe it's right but it's missing something, so we need to combine it with another one. So yeah, you can, you can customize. I have one. Um, do you have any kind of top tips or hints for people if they're designing, designing their own logo? Um, designing their own logo. Well, yeah. it's really good. Um, this is not like a sales pitch or anything, but if you go to our website, all the archetypes <laughs> are there. Um, so if you want to have a look through them and kind of read through them and see who you, so not who you personally are as a, as a person, what your personal archetype is, but who you are as a brand. Um, <coughs> You know, if you just want to have a read through, then and you kind of feel like you know who you might be of that one, and then you can kind of use that as a starting point and as a reference point to get back to when you're designing your own logo. You know, if you if you pick a color, if you pick, if you pick yellow and you think, oh, but does that really go with with this archetype? And then if you're not sure, then maybe maybe it's not yellow. Maybe it's not yellow. No more questions? No more questions? No. I think that's it. Alright, I'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time. We had a bang. Quite a lot of wine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, I really enjoyed that. I always love looking at the cars as well. And I think I still remember the um, empathy video that you're trying not to say, at least to anyone. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Clear's I know. presentation last yeah. Year, so. And I mean, you know, it's still very human to say at least and to also be sympathetic mm. because you can't you can't empathize with everybody. Yeah. Um, but it's good to have it kind of in the back of your mind. And I, I just noticed that they're all here on the wall as well. So if you want to have a read through yeah. all of them, then um, then you can do it here as well. Cool. Well, thank cool. you so much. Thank you guys for having me. for coming down guys it's been an amazing turnout um, so next week we have web design um, I think we'll be running through how to build a simple um, website within an hour I think hopefully um, so that'll be really good um, also if you could leave us some feedback um, on the website that's up on the posters as you leave through the door that'd be amazing so thank you very much cool.